Hi, um, I'm Wally Kringle. I'm a associate professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington. I'm going to talk today about the evaluation and management a little bit on uh, the uh, problems of back pain in children and adolescents. Um, basically, we're going to go over the, the really common conditions that are associated with uh, back pain that will represent the vast majority of kids you see with back pain. And we'll talk a little bit about the rare things that everybody's worried about, but are actually quite rare. We'll also talk about the underlying incidence of back pain and the myth that it's an uncommon and rare problem. As I said, we're going to talk about the evaluation of back pain in children and adolescents, and maybe a little, little bit about uh, managing it. Um, when we think about evaluating back pain, most people think this is a big burden on us. Um, but in fact, as orthopedists, most of the patients we see are coming in about something with pain. People tend to dread the evaluation of back pain in adults, but it can actually be quite interesting. Um, it, instead of seeming boring like watching grass grow and putting you to sleep, hopefully this will be at least a little bit educational and, and keep your interest. Um, as orthopedists, neurosurgeons in family medicine or pediatrics, we, we essentially won the lottery because we get to evaluate so many people with back pain. We think of, uh, we get a lot of training in medical school and residency about adult back pain because it's a, it's a large burden of, um, of disability um, and it's very common. We think of it as really common. We, we're taught that if we take x-rays of people, adults with back pain, they're gonna be the same as people that don't have back pain, that it's almost always gonna go away no matter what we do that most of it's caused by degenerative arthritic changes and that um, it's almost always benign unless there are neurologic symptoms, you have significant history of weight loss or previous history of malignancy or major trauma. And so it's, we basically tend to, uh, tend to be learned to treat it by benign neglect almost, at least for the first couple months. We're also taught that back pain in children and adolescents is really rare. There's lots of studies in the past that say back pain is rare in kids. And that it obviously, that it may denote a very serious problem. The situations where kids come in with what seems like minor back pain and eventually are found to have a spinal cord tumor or another malignancy or leukemia uh, get a lot of attention, but they're actually really rare in comparison to uh, the general uh, large incidence of kids with back pain. So is it really rare? Well, there's a couple studies that have looked at how rare back pain is in kids. Um, Dr. Skaggs in uh, Los Angeles um, uh, interviewed 1,540 children between the ages of 11 and 14 years and 37% of them had experienced back pain in the past and 34% had limited their activity due to back pain and 14% had actually used medication for back pain. This doesn't seem like a rare condition. There's a study um, uh, by Dr. Coravesis looking at the incidence of back pain in children by age um, their, their year in school, and we look at the incidence in girls and in boys. Um, this is for lower back pain, and we see that up to 70% of girls in the sixth grade have had lower back pain. It's a little less common in boys, but it gets more common as kids get a little older. We look at the same statistic for thoracic back pain, something that um, we don't think very much about uh, typically. Really common, again, in girls, 70 percent, 30, 40, 50 percent. It's, these are really common issues. When doctors think that they're rare and they usually denote a very serious underlying medical problem, it sways our, our feelings about it. 
So we, d we looked a few years ago at how common it is here, and we found that um, in one fiscal year, the Department of Orthopedics had over 2,000 clinic visits for back pain in children. In the past, it's been noted that 50% of the time we can find an identifiable cause. That means 50% of the time we never do. So when we think of back pain in children and adolescents, um, we're trying to look at the really at the really common problems. We're gonna we're gonna not really talk about this one. Kids that have been in major accidents, major car accidents, they've fallen out of a tree. That's a separate group of patients that we're not really going to consider. If you're at a trauma center, this is what you're seeing. But this is a very small percentage of kids that come in with back pain. You do need to ask about it, and you particularly need to ask teenagers who might have been out with their friends and don't want their parents to know that they fell out of a two-story window the day before. But you need, you need to ask about it. But generally, we're talking about kids without a major trauma history. So the most common problems we're going to see are acute spondylolysis. Spondylolysis is a stress fracture that's very common in the lower back. Chronic spondylolysis, which is an acute spondylolysis that has been round, uh, around long enough that we'll call it chronic. Schurman's disease, or Schmorl's nodes in the lumbar region, in the thoracolumbar region, often are a cause of chronic back pain. Disc herniations and uh, congenital abnormality in the way the uh, spine is formed um, at the lumbosacral junction, called a Bertolotti malformation. Um, and then intra-abdominal and retroperitoneal causes um, due to, say, constipation, uh, kidney infection, uh, ruptured uh, follicular ovarian cysts. These are things that we see in, in people too. Constipation, particularly in little kids, and pyelonephritis and ruptured um, ovarian cysts in, in adolescent girls. We do also see disc herniation and degenerative changes present in fairly young kids, uh, young teenagers often. But Unless you find one of these, the next most common, and possibly the most common overall, is the, there are many names for it, functional back pain, nonspecific back pain, RSD, soft tissue back pain. Basically, with every fancy test we can do, we can't find a reason for it. We can't find an identifiable anatomical, identifiable anatomical cause for it, and it uh, it's a big uh, problem that, that we see a lot, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what we can do about that and what gives you clues that that's what you're going to be dealing with. So we're trying to differentiate those problems we just talked about from the much more rare conditions like a tumor in the sacrum or discitis or infection in the lower back, which can just present as back pain. This is an MRI of a disc space infection, and this is a CT scan of a sacral tumor. So basically, when I walk into a room to evaluate someone with back pain, I'm, I'm sort of trying to sort out the simple, straightforward, benign problem from something really bad. And I'm trying to look at, does this patient have, have any have, have a set of symptoms, findings, and history that's consistent with one of the classic common problems, or should I be worried that there's something unusual going on, one of those rare things? So first we're going to talk a little bit about acute spondylolysis, which is medical ease for a stress fracture that occurs in the lower back in usually active kids. Um, they are not congenital. They aren't found in newborn, uh, newborns, and they're more common the more active people are. Um, acute spondylolysis means it's happened recently. It, you, the history is usually there's acute pain in the lower back that prevents activity. That is, there's a child who's playing soccer who gets enough back pain that he has to come out of the game. For the next couple weeks, he can't get through practice. He can't get through game. 
through a game, and he had and it's pain at the lumbosacral junction in the lower back, often one side, but sometimes in the middle or just around the whole lumbosacral junction. It occurs during activity. It's worse with activity, and it hurts when you lean back, when you bend backwards at the lumbosacral junction. It's classic. If you've had pain for a week and you're an active kid and it prevents activity and it hurts when you lean back, you probably have an acute spondylolysis. These kids, if they lay around and watch TV, the back pain gets better. If they take some anti-inflammatories, it gets better. Let me go back just a second. This is an axial cut of a CT that shows an acute spondylolysis. There's been a stress reaction or a, a chronic reactive inflammatory condition with repetitive microtrauma to the bone in the pars interarticularis region, which on the sagittal image you can see here, between the superior facet and the inferior facet, there's a lot of force that goes through this region and people get a stress fracture. We can tell it's acute because there's barely a crack. It hasn't remodeled. It, there, this looks like a fracture that might heal with rest. Usually it's in kids that are active and they're hyperextending their lower back with these activities and they're putting a lot of load in the lower lumbar region, particularly at L5-S1 and uh, L4, where these fractures are most common. The vast majority happen at, L at the L5 vertebra. With hyperextension, there's a lot of load in this area and people get accumulate microtrauma in that area. It's a watershed vascular area. The inferior facet will impinge on this area with extension, so we see activities that people extend a lot, giving um, this being common. Competitive Olympic gymnasts, about 30% of them have developed a, a spondylolysis at some point. Again, it hurts in the lower back. It's very important we ask kids when they say they have back pain where the back pain is because I've seen many, many patients that come in with an x-ray of their lower back and when we ask them where their back pain is, they say it's up here. It, we're not even looking at the right area. The back is a big place. In spondylolysis, it hurts down here, not up here. Um, often in the early stages, if we get a plain x-ray, it will be normal. We can also identify it by obtaining a bone scan, which shows markedly increased uptake, even at the stage when the x-ray is normal. Um, at the pars interarticularis, it can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, in this study, um, uh, published in 1995, a group uh, looked at a large number of patients that had acute spondylolysis that, um, that presented with pain in their lower back. They got a CT scan of their lower back at the time of diagnosis was made, and then six months later, the treatment if they had a spondylolysis was brace and no sports for six months. That was the prescribed treatment. We don't know whether the kids did it. When they looked at the six months follow-up to see whether that stress fracture had healed, if it was early, there was just a crack, there wasn't a big gap, the bone hadn't remodeled, 30, um, that represented 40% of the defects and 73% of them had healed bone to bone. So they end up with an anatomically, mechanic, biomechanically normal back. In the ones that were mid-stage, it was starting to remodel. There was starting to be a gap. It had probably been present for three, three months or so. Um, only 38% of them looked healed at follow-up. And if it was late, if there was an established gap, the bone was completely remodeled, the area was filled in with scar, the odds of healing at follow-up at six months was 0%. So what do we know about that? If we have people rest and brace when they present early, they'll probably heal, particularly if it's just unilateral. 
if we wait, if we have them go through physical therapy for months and months and see whether they're going to get better, we let them play like we would an adult. We'd encourage them to remain active. Most of them won't heal. Is this a big problem? Well, over a couple years or five years of follow-up, it may not be. In the long term, though, in um, young adults, 20s through the 40s, there's a fairly significant percentage of people with chronic low back pain where it's due to a chronic spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis that end up very disabled from it. It may be a small percentage of the patients who have them, but it uh, represents a large number of patients that, are, that have major problems that re require surgery later. And it's probably better to end up with a biomechanically normal back. So we think that for acute spondylolysis, you're probably better off stopping your activity, resting, plus or minus using a brace. This is an example of an early spondylolysis on a CAT scan. This is late. There is no way with rest and a brace we can get that to heal. This may or may not be symptomatic. So again, we talked about uh, rest. A brace is a little bit controversial. It's hard to show that it makes a lot of difference. I like to use it particularly in adolescent athletic boys and, some, and girls because this is what adolescent boys do as soon as their back stops hurting. The brace is at least a reminder to them not to participate in stuff like this. At least people think about it a little bit more. Chronic spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. So in patients who've had a stress fracture in the past and it didn't heal, the, the forces all go through the disc space. And over time, the disc degenerates. The ligaments loosen up a little bit and the bone slides forward because of the shape of the lower back, the lordotic posture. And it slides forward a little bit. This sliding forward of one vertebra at the area where the pars defect is, is called an ismic spondylolisthesis. Chronic spondylolysis is there, this gap pres is re uh, present, but there is no slippage forward. We tend to see that more in people with less lumbar lordosis. Um, in these patients, these are fairly common. They have low back pain that's been present for months and months. It, it recurs, it flares up and down. If they're a lot really active, it gets worse. If they're, um, uh, but they're able to get through a game and activity. It's just kind of bothersome to them. If they take it easy or take anti-inflammatories, they feel better. The vast majority don't need to ever have surgery, which would be the end stage treatment for that, at least over the next 10 years. Um, and they can usually be managed by core strengthening, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories as needed, and rest. This is an appearance of a chronic spondylolysis um, uh, with a grade one spondylolisthesis. We see the gap there. They look normal, they walk normal. Extension usually causes increased pain. None of these patients have sciatic tension signs or tight hamstrings. The next most common problem we see uh, that, that's uh, fair, um, that for some reason people uh, often have trouble recognizing is Schurmans, lumbar and thoracolumbar Schurmans. If we look at the vertebral bodies, we see, and the disc spaces and the end plates, we see in this area that the end plate is irregular. There's little divots, and the vertebra are a little bit wedged. The disc space is narrowed down. This is the result of what we call Schurmann's disease, or Schmorl's nodes. Those are the little divots in the uh, spine. These create a situation which acts basically like arthritis or wear and tear arthritis in a joint. The disc space is a joint in the lower back. When we look, if it's in this area, the patient, if they're having pain with activity, will usually say their pain is just below it. If it's in the thoracolumbar junction, where the changes are, we'll usually see the pain 
at the thoracolumbar junction or the upper lumbar region, not the lower back, not at the lumbosacral junction, not the really low back, but here. They'll say back pain, they'll say lower back pain, but it's in a different area when you talk to them. Again, it doesn't hurt down here. It hurts in this area, depending on where the Schuermann changes are. Some people have them in the thoracic spine. They also get kyphotic or a more rounded back appearance, and they'll have pain even a little higher with activity. These are the disc spaces in, uh, in infants and children. We see this is the residual notochord. It makes a soft spot in the end plate of the, this is the vertebral body and the disc space as it's forming. This residual notochord makes a soft spot and it's thought that over time when the bone is still soft, the end plate isn't firm, that in, the activity and forces on the disc, the disc is actually s stronger than the, the bone at that point and the disc will push up into these divots. It will create an irregular surface and over time the disc uh, degenerates. And we see the darkened degenerated changes of these discs where the Schuermanns are present. These look very similar to older adults that have arthritic changes um, in their back. And when you take a history, it sounds just like the history of a patient with degenerative arthritis in their knee joint. If they're more active, they get more pain later in the day. They're stiff and achy in the morning for a little while. As they warm up, it feels better. If they take it easy for a while, they have less back pain. And anti-inflammatories help. So they're improved with anti-inflammatories, rest. If it gets really bad, sometimes we'll brace just to mechanically support the area and take the load off for a while. Their exam usually is completely normal. Sometimes they have pain with flexion. They don't have the classic lumbosacral pain with extension that a spondylolysis d does. And they might have a slightly more rounded back appearance. But they basically look completely normal on an examination. They don't have straight leg raising. They don't have neurologic symptoms. One of the, maybe the most common or the second most common behind those two things that would be what we would, what I would say is the back pain where we're never going to find a di an actual diagnosis. We're not going to find an anatomic abnormality that clearly explains the back pain. This has been called a lot of different things in the, pack, in the past, nonspecific back pain, soft tissue back pain, RSD, ma many things. But basically, the most common presentation is a teenage girl between 9 and 15, uh, a, a, a teenage girl um, who is in a stage of um, where s socially things are becoming maybe a little more stressful. Um, when we ask them how bad their pain is, they'll say it's somewhere between a 9 and a 15 on a 10 scale. That's the responses we get. But they're still the captain of the volleyball team and the basketball team and the track team. They're still the head of the cheerleading squad. They're still a, a grade A student, uh, and they're really stressed out about whether they're going to get into Harvard or Stanford. They're, they have a lot of other concerns going on, on. Often when they come in and you're talking with them, if you ask them a question, mom answers or dad answers. They argue about what the actual answer is. They're often, they often look very annoyed to be in, in to see the doctor. They may have an underlying idea that probably the doctor isn't going to find anything, <laughs> but they will go along with their family's feelings about it. Because mom and dad are worried that their daughter or their son, their teenage son, has, uh, has very, a very serious problem or cancer or uh, some, some really bad underlying problem. Usually, by the time we see them, they've gone through 50 visits with the physical therapist, they've tried anti-inflammatories, they've gone to the acupuncturist, the chiropractors, they've done everything. And none of it has helped. 
Usually, when you ask them where their pain is, often, at first, they can't even tell you where the pain is. That gives you a clue that it may not be an easily identifiable anatomical problem like spondylolysis or spondyla or Schurman's, where people will clearly identify for you exactly where the pain is. Often, and often, it's all over the back. It's in the neck, it's in the upper back, it's in the middle back, it's in the lower back, it's in the buttock. It's, and it's, they, but often they'll have difficulty identifying where the pain is. They usually look comfortable, irritated. They usually have tenderness to superficial palpation over all the muscles, the paraspinous muscles. When you ask them to move, they have completely normal range of motion. They can do cartwheels down the hall. They can do jumping jacks for you. They can bend over backwards and touch their hands to the floor. And they look, they do not demonstrate that any of it causes any pain, but they'll, they'll, you, when you ask them, they'll sort of often giggle or smile and say that it's very bad. It's a 12 out of 10 pain when they're doing that. It's, a very, it's very, very common to see this combination of issues. If we get labs looking for rheumatologic disease, they're normal. CBC, SED rate, CRP, HLA B27, rheumatoid factor, we can get every test. They're going to be normal. When we get x-rays, they're normal. However, often the x-rays show other things that we see in normal population of people that are asymptomatic, such as spondylolysis, degenerative change in the disc, mild Schurman's changes. Often they've had x-rays, they've had everything else, and the family is still worried. We think about whether reassurance with some sort of more global screening tests like a bone scan or an MRI, which often the family insists upon, should be done. Um, the vast majority of these are going to be completely normal, but they are reassuring to everyone. Unfortunately, it's an expensive workup when often there are many clues to the fact that the entire workup is going to be normal. Um, I think it's really important not to not to dismiss this problem when you see patients because often you'll walk into a room and you have an immediate sense that this is the issue. Um, you, however, it's very important that you be sincere, that you be thorough, that you try to convince yourself and them that there really isn't a bad problem going on. Be open to the possibility you may need to start getting into a discussion about chronic pain and the other uh, factors in life that may be more effective at improving their situation and their pain than more physical therapy or more uh, medication or more tests because this becomes a very frustrating problem for the family and expends a huge amount of resource when often people are better redirected towards other types of uh, treatment. We often refer to our adolescent medicine colleagues who, and some of them are extremely good with chronic pain issues, which are very common in this population. Um, often the screening tests and the questions that adolescent medicine people get into identify some really unusual problems going on at home and in social life. Some examples, a brother was choking the girl nearly till unconsciousness frequently, and no one was doing anything about it. She hadn't let anyone know. She was scared. Mother getting drunk every night and screaming at the family. Multiple, this we see a lot. There have been multiple recent deaths in the family. When we ask if something's going, when I ask if there's anything else stressful going on in life, we'll often have the mom or dad and daughter or son look at one another and give funny looks and then say no, but clearly there's something else going on. Separations, divorces, abuse going on at home. Um, and the other situation we see is high level athletes that are really not interested in pursuing their sport, but their parents are. So 
even though um, uh, we think of disc herniation and degenerative changes as being an adult problem, we actually see them in adolescents fairly often. Uh, they often are undiagnosed for a long time because people don't really think that a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old could have a disc herniation. Um, and they have basically the same set of symptoms. Sudden onset of pain in the lower back, proceeding to pain in the buttock or thigh or what we think of as sciatica. Frequently has been present for a long time. Um, it seems to me that they usually don't get better on their own and there's probably some reasons for it because most of them are protrusions, not extrusions, and the body doesn't reabsorb them over time. And they're strong, healthy disc tissue as opposed to in really severely degenerated discs. They, um, sometimes there are end plate fractures associated with them that will heal and give a big bony prominence. They usually hurt with flexion rather than extension, and that gives them pain in their buttock or thigh. They often come in with a list. Sometimes they're referred because they have scoliosis because they're standing so awkwardly, their body trying to move away from the pain. They're usually stiff on forward bending, and they virtually all have what we call a positive straight leg raising signs, which is irritation of the nerve root as you pull up, as you straighten out the leg because it pulls the nerve root into the underlying disc. This is, a, uh, I think, a 13-year-old with a disc protrusion that's compressing the S1 nerve root on the left side. If time and uh, the usual physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, et cetera, don't help, they are, sometimes we actually do discectomies, microdiscectomies in children, and they usually get better. Um, the other thing that's fairly common in unilateral lumbosacral back pain that has failed to respond to other treatments is a Bertolotti malformation with where there is a segmentation anomaly at the lumbosacral junction, the transverse, what should be a small transverse process like here at L5, the body had trouble deciding whether to completely separate and turn this into soft tissue or whether it wanted to remain part of the sacrum on one side. So this transverse process is enormous and it touches the sacrum and it acts uh, like a pseudoarthrosis or a non-healed fracture where the bone rubs on the bone of the transverse process rubs on the bone of the sacrum. They'll identify where their pain is. Again, increase with activity, better with anti-inflammatories and rest. A bone scan will be hot here. A CT scan shows it looks like sclerosis and a uh, area of reactive bone. If it can't be relieved by the usual uh, rest, anti-inflammatories, brace, activity modifications, core strengthening exercises, and is too lifestyle limiting, either a resection of that area or fusion of these two bones together will usually resolve it. This is an example of the same person. Often there's a sort of a residual or um, a vestigial disc at the level which was sort of a only partially completely separated from the sacrum as opposed to a normal lumbosacral area. And then when we get a bone scan, we see a lot of uptake where that, where that uh, pseudo-articulation is present. This is someone who improved after a fusion of that area. This is a representation of the CAT scan where we see this small uh, zone where the bone is touching and irritated. It looks like a pseudo joint. Some of the rarer problems that we run into are um, discitis, where there's an infection that comes through the bloodstream and settles in the poorly vascularized disc space and slowly festers. Uh, there's usually it presents as just lower back pain. It takes a long time till people get sick or a fever, and it takes a long time until there are any x ray changes. This is a couple months after presentation. All we see is the disc space looks narrower. This took a few months to get to this stage. 
this is what an MRI looks like at that point, and over time it can completely destroy the disc space and the bone fuses together. It's treated by um, brace and, and antibiotics in the acute stage. Occasionally people have chronic back pain where this healed and they have this pseudoarthrosis area that will be hot on a bone scan, increase pain with activity, and might uh, respond to surgical management rarely. When we see kids with bony tumors or intraspinal tumors, the classic set of symptoms and findings are they have pain at night. It's usually spontaneous, slow onset. It's not usually related to activity. That, it, that is, they have it at rest as much as they have it with activity. It's often in younger patients, and it's classic for them to have stiffness on a physical exam. When they bend forward, they look really stiff. They look awkward and stiff when they try and get around, and they stand with a stiff, awkward, uh, unusual appearance. This is a child who has leukemia. The young child, a, a young child with multiple bony abnormalities um, uh, and back pain, uh, who, who has leukemia. These are visualized on a lateral X-ray. We see compression fractures at multiple areas. So, um, just a brief summary: um, the history. Usually, you have a a really good clue of what's going on just by asking where is it? If it's in the lower back, we're thinking about spondylolysis, degenerative changes, disc herniations, sometimes inflammatory disease like spondyloarthropathy, um, and um, is it unilateral or bilateral? That can help you sort it out. In the upper lumbar or thoracal lumbar region, we're thinking about Schurman's, pyelonephritis, other types of tumors, occasionally with direct trauma, transverse process fractures with minor trauma, discitis and constipation in the younger kids, which we always ask about. And if it hurts everywhere, all over the back, it's often, no matter what tests you do, you're not going to find an underlying anatomical problem. We think about how it started, does it sound like it's a stress fracture, a disc herniation, or a fracture? Or was it insidious, like Schurman's, or degenerative changes, or constipation, inflammatory disease, or discitis, or tumor? Is it worse with more activity, like Schurman's, chronic spondylolysis, or degenerative changes, or Bertolotti? Or is it actually so bad it prevents activity particularly activities that involve uh, high impact loading activities, spondylolysis is going to be your most common. Then we think about disc herniation and other more serious problems. Um, and when we do an exam, the most common thing we do is look if they have lower back pain is see if it hurts with extension. If, if it does, they probably have a spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis. We look at whether they're stiff or have a list or scoliosis when they're standing to see what to give us a clue that there's an irritative lesion like a disc herniation infection or a tumor present. We do straight leg raising findings. Yeah, I usually do it seated, which is just pulling the leg straight, which would represent irritation of the nerve root from disc herniation, occasionally uh, neurologic problems, um, or high grade spondylolisthesis, which are very rare. Uh, have that. And then tenderness. Are they focally tender at the lumbosacral junction over the spinous process, which would be spondylolysis? Or they do they have diffuse tenderness through all the paraspinous muscles? That goes along with the patients where we're not going to find a diagnosis. Are they tender in the thoracal lumbar or upper lumbar region in the paraspinous region like lumbar Schurman's or pyelonephritis, or do they have no tenderness? Or is their exam completely normal? Where it often means we're not going to find an abnormality. So the short summary, actually evaluation of back pain, 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 pain can be fun. Uh, 
it can be challenging. Uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Most of the time, the, you'll be able to identify the most likely problem just by the history and a very brief exam, these being the most common. Remember, bad problems are rare, and there are usually clues to them that we've talked about. And it's important to be thorough and sincere and uh, try your best to, to um, find her if there's a problem and help the patient solve the problem. Thanks.